Good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear clearly. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank AHDB for hosting this series of webinars on, on uh, Blue Tongue virus. It's a significant issue. I think we're up to uh, webinar three. There will be further webinars, and I'd invite you to uh, go to the AHDB website for uh, details of future webinars. Um, just as a brief introduction in terms of myself, I'm uh, the Head of External Affairs for AIMS, which is the largest trade body for the meat sector, and the President of the Vets all, uh, in Europe working in food controls. Tonight we have, um, or this afternoon, we have a, a, a range of speakers who will cover a significant number of the issues that are affecting us as a sector. There will be questions that will come through, and I'll ask you to put those questions into the chat as we go along. Uh, and we will try and answer those at the end. So we will have the speakers until about 5.30, after which we will have a question and answer session. Now, we may or may not be able to answer all of the questions uh, tonight. Uh, if there is a question that we're unable to answer, then we will either refer you to the, re the uh, resources that I'll speak to you about at the end of this uh, session, or um, we will uh, go away and find the answer to those. As we're all aware, this, this, the, the virus is causing significant disruption across the industry, not just in the producer end of the uh, supply chain, but also the processor supply chain. So if you've got any particular questions with regards to the processor aspects, then please don't hesitate to ask me uh, similarly. If I can introduce our speakers tonight, uh, we have uh, first off Andy Smith, who's from Exotic Disease Policy from DEFRA, and he will be speaking to us uh, with regards to the current situation, movements and licensing. We will then move on to Sasha van Helvoort, who is the veterinary head of um, outbreak, uh, outbreak delivery for APHA, going through symptoms and testing uh, and, and those uh, related issues. Chris Dodds, who will be known to many of you in, He's head of the Livestock Auctioneers Association. Uh, we'll be talking through the uh, movements through the livestock markets, followed by Fiona Lovett, uh, a, a, an industry specialist who will be speaking to with regards to flock health issues. The webinar is being recorded and it will be circulated so that you'll get a copy of this. So if there is any information that, that is put on the webinar that you don't pick up as we go along, you will have an opportunity to receive that subsequently. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Andy if he would please to start um, his uh, presentation, please. Yeah, thanks very much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll put a presentation up. I'm going to run through it quite quickly for time reasons um, and just focus on the latest situation. Hopefully I will share that now. Can you all see a presentation? Not yet, Andy. Okay. So try again. Can you see it now? Absolutely. Thank you, Andy. Oh, great stuff. OK, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so uh, as it's already been introduced, I'm Andy Smith. I lead on livestock uh, disease control policy for DEFRA. Um, very briefly, the sort of latest situation in, t in terms of the disease position is we've now had 110 premises um, where we've confirmed one or more cases of blue tongue three and um, I think you'll have noticed that the zones have been extended and they now and a restricted zone now covers um, from East Riding in North Yorkshire all the way down to the West Sussex Hampshire border area. Um, there are some uh, further cases um, elsewhere in, in the country, individual cases where they uh, there are currently no disease control zones in place. Um, but we are having individual cases declared and confirmed, and we can touch on them briefly in a moment. And in terms of the international situation, there is pretty widespread disease in 
a number of European countries which are around our border ranging from the Netherlands um, through Germany, France, etc. So I, I won't go through all of those, but but it's quite widespread and has spread rapidly over the uh, summer um, into the autumn now. Um, I think the other kind of key headline on the latest situation is um, there are now uh, three uh, auth uh, vaccines that have now been permitted for use in in the UK, and that then they're now available either under for use under a general license in certain parts of south and east england um, or you can apply for through a specific license to use it elsewhere um, that's just a table of the distribution of those 110 um, premises affected you can see it covers quite a right uh, wide area but most of those cases have been in norfolk and, and suffolk and essex um, very very quick bit of background uh, about how did it get here? It's most likely being windborne incursions, and there's a there's a lot of pictures there, but but the ones on the right hand side are, are, they show the kind of extent of disease in different European countries, and the um, model there that's um, uh, animating on the left um, is kind of the way it may well have arrived here through wind plumes. So there, these this is spread through midge vectors which have picked up on the wind and carried to the UK. So there is a disease control framework which is published on the website. I'm not going to run through the, the detail of it, but, but essentially it was a, a, a way of escalating controls based on what happened. And um, we've gone through a phase of kind of uh, pretty small uh, zones to expanding zones at the moment. And that uh, policy has been kept under review and, and could change further um, yet according to that strategy. So the first case arrived in um, effectively on the border of Norfolk and Essex back on the 26th of August. I won't go through the, the details here, but we declared a, a 20 kilometer temporary control zone. Um, that was why we established how it got there, whether it might have spread. And then that was very quickly extended following three further cases on the 28th of August um, to a, a slightly odd shape on the Norfolk Suffolk um, border and then by the 30th of August we concluded there was some form of circulating disease in that area and moved to the next part of that control strategy where we declared a restricted zone covering Norfolk and Suffolk and then um, uh, we were looking at how might it have arrived and you can see from these pictures here that these wind plumes could have moved it over from um, the continent into the areas of Norfolk, Suffolk and including further north of that and further south into Essex. So um, on the 2nd of September we had further cases and extended the restricted zone down into Essex. And on the 4th of September, we found our first case up in East Riding of Yorkshire, where a temporary control zone was also declared. So those cases continued. I'm just going to spin through this now to, to where we are in the latest situation. But it has it progressed over in the, the following period through September. And you can see how it's ex gradually expanded. And by the 17th of September, it's covered a lot of um, east of England, uh, including the, the East Riding Yorkshire area and into Lincolnshire, but there was a gap. But most recently, um, 21st of September, there were further cases and we've extended the zone now on the 30th of September. Well, 21st of September, we extended to fill in most of those gaps. And by the 30th of September, we have now found further cases in West Sussex and Hampshire border and the zones have now been declared. Uh, extended sorry to 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 those areas um, so so that was sorry let's go back to that so so that is where we currently are in, to, in terms of the disease situation in terms of the controls there are two types of licenses available to allow people to move things one is a general license which is published on the websites and the other is a specific license for which you can apply through the licensing portal 
to obtain a specific license to move things that aren't otherwise approved. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details of these um, licenses just for the sake of time. But um, if you need to work out whether you're in a zone, there is an interactive map. If you search for the interactive map online, you will find a map where you can put in your postcode or map reference and establish whether you are in a zone. Um, and, and any premises that is partly in those zones is, is fully in those zones. And these rules apply to ruminant animals and to camelids. Um, so um, other animals such as pigs and poultry are free to move as normal as no restrictions on them. But there are restrictions on germinal products, that's embryo over and semen, and there's restrictions on moving them out of the restricted zone and restrictions on the freezing of them within the restricted zone. Um, again, just very briefly, you can, despite some things being prohibited, you can move things still. So there's moves to slaughter within the zone, moves from farm to farm, and moves into and out of markets are all permitted within the zone. And you can freely move germinal products within the zone. What you can't do with germinal products is freeze them unless you comply with the conditions of a license, which you need to apply for. Um, you can move from certain things uh, we, we do permit to move from the inside the zone to outside of the zone so there's a general license published to allow moves from within the zone out to slaughter um, and you can apply for a specific license for other kind of moves so that's a moves from a, a farm to another a farm within a zone to a farm outside of a zone um, what you can't currently do is apply to move animals from a market in the zone to a, another premises outside of the zone to live and you can't move the animals from within the zone to a market outside the zone with the intention of selling them to live. You can now move from uh, markets that are red markets direct to slaughter and that's a very recent change in the last um, week. So whilst that's uh, now allowed there is still some work on certifying the, the relevant abattoirs and, and uh, markets to, to make that happen, but that's um, underway. And I think Chris is going to talk more about that shortly. Um, and the final um, kind of big thing is vaccination. So vaccines are now available. Um, there are a choice of three um, which are available to uh, through your veterinarian. And um, if you are in one of the high risk counties you can rely on the general license if you're outside of the high risk counties uh, you can apply for a specific license and we're keeping that under review so i'm going to stop there and hand over i think to sasha as i probably already overrun so oh is that me sasha <laughs> i'll stop thank sharing you. thank you andy thank you very much andy can i just have a, a quick comment Given the um, climatic changes as we move into autumn, are we working on the principle that spread is going to be um, in the main as a result of movement of animals? Therefore, containment is by virtue of movement control in, in, in the main. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, clearly midges can move and we can't control the movement of midges. Um, the uh, big risk, I think, for long distance spread of disease or rapid spread is through the movement of animals, whether that be over the summer or now as we move into the autumn. So, um, yes, absolutely. As we move to the autumn, I think long distance spread is pr going to be primarily through movement of animals. So, so the, um, and I think that's true during the summer as well. Yeah. yeah so, so movement restrictions are incredibly important um, and, and can't be overemphasized. Thank you for that, Andy. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sasha, are you able to come in there? Yeah, I yeah. If I can share my screen, then. Amy, can you help Sasha share her screen? Sasha, do you have the share button at the bottom of the screen? Yeah, but it's not. Ah, there it is. Now it is. Sorry. 
she wasn't there. Right, I'm going to go really quickly through this, but I didn't mention it last time and I thought it would be really good just to quickly go over clinical signs again. Just reminding everyone what blue tongue is, that it's vector borne, um, that the severity of signs varies between um, the various species and breeds and also the serotype because we've got um, a wide variety of different serotypes. And also to remember, to remind you all that it's a disease of ruminants, so cattle, sheep, goats and deer, and obviously camelids, um, and llamas and alpacas. Um, but uh, currently we still haven't had any cases in uh, llamas and alpacas. Um, then, um, like I mentioned, there's a variety of ones, uh, blue tongue virus one, three, four, eight. There's a lot more, but these are the ones that we've been seeing in Europe um, and BTV8 obviously is well known. Just also to add that midges, um, which is uh, obviously the, um, the midge that spreads this disease, the colloquoidus, lays its eggs in wet organic matter. Um, such as decaying leaf litter, manure and other vegetation. So keeping your yards clear of, of all that organic matter is, is really helpful. And um, as you're all aware, it's not only spread by biting midges, but it can also be spread um, through semen and ova and embryos. And um, obviously also by long distance moves. And then quickly, the, um, the uh, way it works is you have an infected host and um, a midge bites it then within that minute within four days it might be a bit longer now because the days have become a bit cooler this midge can become infected and then bites the host which then takes two to four days um, for it to become infected and then a new midge can be um, infected again so on the signs that we've seen, um, I'll just do the first few. So cattle, we're seeing a lot less signs than sheep, um, but we're also seeing, we often hear the farmers saying that the animals are a lot more quiet. Um, they're often also mentioning lameness as one of the um, initial uh, signs that they see, as well as red membranes and um, eyes that are infected or tearing. For sheep, um, we're often told as one of the first signs is that there's a lot of nasal discharge. This could be um, purulent, but it could equally be clear discharge. These animals are often um, quite lethargic and they often are lying down as well. Um, we have had mention of salivation and lameness as well um, and um, various other things, but there's a whole list there and you can look back on that. Um, then these are some of the pictures, which a lot of you will have seen, but I'm sure there's some people new here. So we've got redness on teats for clinical signs in cattle, red noses, not very clear, but it's, it's, it's there. This one is a lot more, um, the one to the right is a lot more obvious. It's um, got crusting and, and ulceration there on the nose and the lower ones, um, you can see ulceration within the mouth. On the right bottom one, um, you can see um, redness of, of the foot there. Sheep, um, you often see lying down sheep. Um, the one in the middle is um, quite a lot of uh, uh, salivation there. Um, the one next to that, there's bleeding lips because um, it is, uh, we often see a lot of um, issues on places where there's been a lot of um, mechanical damage because the vessels are a lot more, um, they're affected by the virus itself and that can cause the bleeding. So you'll often see it around the mouth, or around the eyes or, or wherever there has been um, any mechanical damage. Um, so a variety of pictures there. Um, again, here you can see the discharge out of the nose, crustiness of the nose um, and swelling as well on, on some of those pictures. So when you see the clinical signs, please report it to us immediately. Because it's a notifiable disease, this is required by law. Please also treat the animals, though. Um, these animals uh, are sick. They they often have fever. They don't want to eat. So um, pain um, pain um, using anti-inflammatories. So to help with the pain is is really helpful, definitely at an early stage. And um, also, you can also call out your vet if if they've got a lot of um, 
discharge and they're really not doing well, please get your vet out. And you might need them out to be able to administer the anti-inflammatories. Um, the restrictions that are placed on, on your farm, um, that doesn't stop anyone coming on. These restrictions are just for um, susceptible animals, so um, ruminants or the alpacas. We have been seeing animals recover. Sometimes they're only ill for a day and then the next day they're a lot better. Um, time will tell if those animals go down here again. Um, so yeah, please, um, and if you have had a positive case on your farm, please do tell us again um, if you've got further cases, because that's really helpful. Um, and then for surveillance visits, um, not everyone is visited, but in those areas where we are undertaking for surveillance, just to be aware of what happens, um, we will sample um, up to 35 cattle on your farm and they all have to be over six months of age. So just so you're aware, but we will be calling you and we'll be explaining this um, prior to our visit to your farm. Um, and yeah, just a quick reminder to uh, register if you've got any temporary land, and there's a lot of information online for that as well. And that's it for me, thanks. Thank you so much for that, Sasha. <clears throat> I think it, uh, one thing that I find really important is the emphasis that uh, to the public that this is not zoonotic and therefore uh, should not in any way affect consumption of lamb and it's important that, that message comes out um, strongly across uh, from AHDB and, and, and the likes. Um, it's, 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 it's an interesting point that I've noticed talking to European colleagues that mortality is higher in those animals that are of, of lower health status. Um, so that's an interesting observation from my European colleagues. And just from a surveillance perspective, given the similarities to foot and mouth, we mustn't ever forget that foot and mouth could actually be hidden in amongst a potential um, disease scenario in and amongst this. But those, those, that's, that's just a comment to my uh, uh, colleagues working in the abattoirs. Uh, moving on uh, from that point then, if I can introduce Chris. Chris is uh, Dodds from the uh, Livestock Auctioneers Association. Chris, can I hand over to you, please? Thank you, Jason. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've just been asked to give you a little bit of an update on uh, movements um, through markets. Uh, and there are very clearly two, two divides here, or a divide between the RZ, the restricted zone, and the free area. Um, farmers in the restricted zone um, can trade um, normally uh, within the restricted zone, uh, with the exception of the farms that have a positive uh, case uh, infected premises. So uh, moving store animals or breeding animals or prime stock into a market within the RZ is perfectly okay under a general license. Uh, they can move into an abattoir in the RZ under a general license. Um, there is the question about, and a lot of people have asked whether people in the RZ can buy breeding and store animals from the free area and bring them into the RZ. And that's absolutely fine. You can do that. So you can go to a market in the free area. You can buy replacement feeding cattle, replace, replacement breeding sheep uh, and bring them home. But as soon as they arrive home, they are treated as RZ animals. So they have the restriction of not easily being able to move out of the RZ. Uh, in the last week, we have uh, managed to um, uh, develop a red market. These, these um, There are two markets just now that have been um, uh, licensed to operate uh, with one or two more in the pipeline, but um, it allows people in the RZ to take finished stock, stock for slaughter, to a market in the free area that's been approved, uh, where they can be sold at that market to uh, designated abattoirs, that's abattoirs that have been authorized to operate for RZ animals, or they can move back into the RZ from that market to an abattoir to kill. Um, they are red markets, so everything that goes into them uh, has to die. So they can't go back to the farm. Uh, they can't go anywhere between the market and the um, the abattoir. So the two markets are actually in the north of England. 
um, that do quite a number of fat cattle. Um, and they've been authorized for a week now, but haven't or aren't holding sales this week because we're still waiting for some crucial abattoirs to uh, be designated and approved by Food Standards Agency and DEFRA, which hopefully will happen this week. And then those markets can uh, draw animals uh, after this week. We're also in um, discussing with DEFRA how, if at all, we could manage to run markets for store animals and breeding animals that are in the RZ that need to move out of the RZ. Um, clearly, a farm to farm move requires pre movement testing on the RZ farm and then post movement testing on the farm in the free area of, of England. Um, and if we um, manage to find a, a, a safe system to use, uh, pre and post movement testing will certainly have to be done on animals that come through markets. Um, I, I'm going to, uh, this introduction from me is rather short. I, I would welcome questions if anyone's confused as to what they're allowed to do or not allowed to do. Um, but um, I think I've captured most of them there. Um, and Andy touched on them when he did his speech at the start. Um, so Jason, I hope that's helpful. It's a very brief summary, but um, maybe it helps you with a bit of time and a few more questions, hopefully. That's really helpful. Thank you for that, Chris. I, I know a number of our members have expressed some degree of frustration with regards to the delay for FSA designation of certain abattoirs. Anyone on the call that has a specific concern, if you want to get in touch with us at Ames, and we will um, uh, facilitate uh, that designation process as best we can. So thank you for that, Chris. That that's really important. Moving on then, Fiona, Fiona Lovett, who's our specialist vet, a sheep vet, who will talk through um, specific details. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Jason. Um, so I'm really representing uh, a number of us right throughout um, the Blue Tongue Working Group, Ruminant Health and Welfare, number of different organisations. We are really keen to know what the impact is of Blue Tongue on UK farmers now. So we have had a lot of information that's come out of the Netherlands and Europe, um, and some of it really quite horrific, um, but we need we need to know how Blue Tongue is affecting our farmers now, um, both to let those farmers who are suffering with cases, to let them know that we care and we, we, we need to know how bad it is, but also for the rest of the country so we can best prepare and we can, um, and vets and farmers can make rational evidence-based decisions on whether and when to vaccinate. So we know we have vac uh, vaccines available um, now in the country, um, but vets need to be advising their farmers and farmers need to be taking decisions about what to do and how to prepare. So this survey is um, it's completely anonymous. We want to know um, from farmers who have cases of blue tongue, obviously it is a notifiable disease. So we fully expect that farmers will notify the authorities when they have cases of blue tongue. I'm afraid anecdotally, I speak to a lot of vets and I know that there are likely, maybe not everyone is reporting it, uh, um, which we are no way condoning. But if that's the case, we still need to know how bad it is. And we still, from an animal welfare and a farm impact point of view, um, we would like to know how bad this is. So uh, we, you should be reporting cases. Either way, um, whether you, you will, people are affected in either way. They may not have cases, but they still are in, impacted by restrictions, by the costs. Um, and this survey is completely anonymous. We cannot trace um, IP addresses. We don't know the people who are reporting. It's very simple to fill in. Um, just can you go to the next slide, please, Kyle? Um, we only launched this at the end of last week. We've had 50 farmers respond already, and actually only five of those 
have actually had cases that they've reported of, of blue tongue. Um, but we know we, there's a lot of free text boxes in this survey. Um, it's taking people less than five minutes to complete the survey. So it's not a big thing. Um, the survey tracks how long responses take and it's four point something minutes at the moment. So don't feel there's any, um, you know, it's going to take you ages, but please do let us know how blue tongue is affecting your farm, whether that is in sick animals or animals that need to be put to sleep or, or whether it's in the fact that the costs and the restrictions are affecting you. So please do encourage anyone you know, the, the little map there shows um, where we've had responses from so far. Um, we can gather that data. My colleague Rachel at the University of Nottingham is really agile in collecting this data and um, putting it together and summarizing it and sending it straight back to the industry representatives so that we can best help people and prepare for the rest of the country. So please, please, there's no reason not to fill in this survey and it will help us get a, an active and um, a clear idea of the impact on UK farmers at the moment. So um, next slide, please, Carl. Um, I'll just leave you, um, please encourage anyone you know to respond to the survey. Um, we can't trace them. If you leave, if people uh, leave their email address, we will then send a summary of, of the results we have, um, but that will also be available to each of the organisations involved um, and uh, to the media and to, to vets and farmers to be able to make good decisions. So um, please, if you're in the area or you're outside the area, but you know there are farmers who are affected, it'd be really, really helpful. You can scan the QR code or um, click through that bit.ly um, so, uh, URL there. That's me, Jason. Thank you, thank you so much for that, uh, Fiona. That's that's really important and helpful, and I can't stress en enough. There's, it, it's a hugely devastating experience whenever any farmer has such a, a, um, a an exotic disease or notifiable disease outbreak affect their farm. But it's so important from a national unity perspective, and for the good of the entire industry, that we do encourage our colleagues, friends, neighbours, etc to report were they to even suspect a potential. Um, it, it's so important to all of us as an, as a, as, as an industry as a whole. <clears throat> um, the, the, I will come on later on to the uh, resources that are available um, to, to support and to inform and to assist uh, those that are affected by it, and I'll talk about those at the end. But if I can encourage you all to please take the survey and the QR code is sitting there for you to uh, to, to zap as you, as you can. We're now, we're now going to move on to the Q&A and I, I, the questions are piling up on my right here. So I'm going to um, start off as would be logical with the first one here. And this is from uh, Johnny Furs. Who says on last week's webinar there was little known about actual mortality or infection rates in infected flocks herds is there any further information about this um because fiona's on the uh, screen i'm going to ask fiona first if not i'll come through to you andy uh, as yet literally the survey has been out for just a couple of days so we've had five farms infected out of that um a couple they uh, picked it up on surveillance and they've not had any mortality uh, one of the farms there had quite high morbidity, quite, quite a number of animals affected, and I think it was four or five percent um, mortality. Uh, but I, but it's that's tiny, tiny figures. We we just don't, I don't think we know uh, the situation in the UK um, at the moment, and that's that's why we're encouraging people to complete the survey. Thank you, Fiona. <clears throat> Andy, would you like to comment or? Are you comfortable with Fiona's response there? Yeah, I, I, and, and Sasha may have more information as well. I don't know. Um, I, I tend to agree. I don't think we have uh, extensive evidence. I think the mortality rates in the UK have been relatively low. But um, again, in, in Europe, we've certainly heard uh, different reports about mortality rates, where a, a flock or herd is affected, particularly sheep flocks. Um, where they're affected, the mortality rates have, have been significant in some cases. Um, so what we don't know is is, is why is why is that? Is that 
just luck with the time of the year do we have uh, some of our breeds are they more resistant um so uh, i think it's, it's quite hard to 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 comment on exactly what we're seeing at this stage and to say there's a lack of full evidence i don't know if sasha you want to add anything to that but if i can just add in there i've seen some interesting research where um red abomazal worm will will actually increase mortality rate were it not to be treated so your antiparasitics your anthelmintic treatments <clears throat> will be uh, uh, and again that just comes back to overall uh, flock health uh, i think to add that concurrent disease is an important one um we we often don't know what's going on they've seen a lot of that this year in, in the netherlands with with hemonchus mycosis in sheep but equally, it could be any other disease. I mean, the immunity is down and then that cause, can cause mortality. But I think it's important to note that we really haven't seen the mortality events that have happened in Holland last year. So um, we definitely are way below that. Really interesting. Thank you for that, Sasha. Uh, German colleagues have noted in some parts of Germany, very low part, uh, mortality rates and other parts of Germany, extremely high mortality rates. So hugely variable. Thank you for that. I'm going to move on to the next question. This is about a movement and uh, of animals but within a holding. So I farm in Berkshire on a multi-site farm with just one holding number. I move animals from one farm to another. What happens if the restriction area is expanded to include one part of Berkshire, resulting in part of the farm being in a restricted area and other farms not being under a restriction? Will I be able to move the animals from one farm to the other um, within the uh, outside of the zone? I'm going to pass that to Andy, I think, or, or Chris. Yeah, shall I pick it up? Uh, obviously, it, it, it depends on the exact scenario. Um, the, the basic rule is if the premises is partly in the zone, then it's wholly in the zone. Um, but when I say premises, I really mean contiguous or largely contiguous um, fields or buildings. Um, clearly where a, 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 say a 10 mile rule holding is separated by 10 plus miles, um, they, they would need, I would suggest a license to move from the part that's in the zone to the part that's outside the zone. Um, moving the other way from outside the zone into the zone, there is no licensing requirement, but to move back out, they would need to obtain a license. So essentially, it's very much dependent on the, the precise scenario for that, that uh, business. I, I hope that's helpful. I, I, it's, um, I think I would refer you to your particular, your, your local vet or your, your practitioner for any specifics in and around that. Uh, but that's, that's, that, that the principle remains there. I'm going to move on to the next que question from Rachel Rogers. At a webinar two weeks ago, the speakers estimated that a map of confirmed cases would be provided within a week. This hasn't happened. Um, when can we get this, please? Um, I'm going to say that I will talk to um, the webinar organizers and we will get that map out to you as soon as we possibly can. I'm going to move on from that point because I don't think anyone can answer that specifically. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next one. What does the temperature need to be for midges to be an active and not bite? And does this need to be a, an average or, um, or, or specific? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump into that one. They'll always bite, whatever the temperature. The only thing that changes is that there is a period that they will not be able to become infectious. So if they bite an infected animal, they have to go through a sequence of events that and that's through the midge itself and that takes anywhere between four to 21 days i think if i saw the if i remember the the, the long date and it's all temperature driven so under 14 an average temperature of um 14 degrees um, it won't work anymore um, and so you need an average of 14 for that cycle to continue so there is a period um where you know the affection doesn't go through but you've still got a lot of positive animals and they can still uh, positive midges which can bite a lot of animals in any case until they die Great. so they can so, so, infect animals 
Thank you, Tasha. So fourteen is the is the is the the the, the magic number to be looking out for as an average. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. That next question. I'm I'm having difficulty finding the specific license for the vaccine. Where should I look? Who would like to jump in on that? Fiona, would you? Um, there's recently the Ruminant Health and Welfare Group have um, the the BTV hub and there's a specific page there for um, vets, which is very helpful. I checked that today and it tells you about general license. It doesn't say for the specific license as yet um, for releasing the vaccines. So that's anyone outside the RZ. I, I don't know if um, Sasha and Andy could say the, the details of of where people can access that. Generally speaking, the ruminant health and welfare um, information for vets is kept as up to date as possible, as quickly as possible. That's where that's where I go to check if the information is available. But I don't can't answer the specific question. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Andy or Sasha. Yeah, I, I go to the APHA. Um, website um, so, the, so the DEFRA website look for licensing um, and uh, there is information there we don't list all of the specific licenses but I think if there's something that you wish to move that isn't listed under a general license it's it's uh, a, apply for a license through the portal but Sasha do you want to add anything on that Oh yeah, I thought I was unmuted. No, that that is uh, yeah. Go through the portal for the specific license. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question, um, Jason, I think AH, I think AHGB have actually got a very good page on the licensing requirements, so um, it's on there as well. That's really helpful. Thank you for that, Chris. So signposting the AHDB, AHDB website then. Uh, staying on the vaccination theme, um, I vaccinated and my vet said that this will cover my use for 12 months. My neighbour's vet has said that revaccination will, will be required next spring. Please, could you offer an opinion? Now, I'm going to go to Fiona on that one. Yeah, I'm not an expert on the vaccines, but the vaccines are based on the, the, the other BTV um, vaccines. And we have... Uh, in, uh, data on length of duration for those vaccines. We don't specifically have it for BTV3 as yet because the vaccines haven't been available for long enough. I know the companies who've brought the vaccines in are doing that work and there's work carrying on in Europe at the moment to look at duration. We're, we're assuming protection would last for a year, that, but I don't think anyone actually has that information yet. It's, it's not on the, the vaccine guidelines because we haven't had a year since anything was vaccinated. They're, they're very new vaccines. Yeah, I, I, I think that's clear. I think we are all in a learning phase at this stage. The next question is a, is a quick one for Andy. Are there any cases in South Lincolnshire at present or on the Norfolk Lincolnshire border? Goodness. Um, I don't know, to be honest. There certainly are ca cases in L Lincolnshire and on uh, uh, in those areas um we've certainly got um cases all around that that part of the country or individual cases um so um yeah i i, I depends on ex exactly where we mean um there are cases in obviously norfolk and there are cases in lincolnshire i mean sasha i don't, don't know if you're aware of any specific locations um I don't have that information to hand, I'm afraid, but there are definitely cases in most of those areas. Um, yeah, yeah, no specifics. I, I did put a tape up earlier, but I don't think I can lay my hands on it quickly. Well, we, well, we, I'm sure yeah. we should. We've, we've had four cases there. in Lincolnshire and 22 in Norfolk, but I can't tell you exactly how many of them are around the, the border. OK, we'll circulate the, the detail of the current map that we have, which I hope for, will be helpful in terms of answering that question. Um, staying on the vaccine um, issue, uh, what has been the rate of uptake of the vaccine? Um, Sasha, is, is this a question for you? It's 
sorry, I'm just looking to see if I could see a map. Um, so we've had, there is um, uptake starting and we've had um, a few big herds, cattle herds, um, where vaccine has been requested. Um, so yeah, it, there, it's, it's starting now um, and people are requesting, I suppose it's, it's as their vets have got access to the um, vaccine, um, the more vets who have access, the more this will continue. So we're very early stages, but it, it, is, it is looking good. It's, it's, it's escalating over time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we hope more people will because it, it yeah, considering what's happening in, in Holland and how, how the animals um, reacted quite positively to the vaccination, it's it's yeah, we hope more people will take it. Good. So it's 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 working, which is which is great. Um, next question is which vaccines are the most popular? I assume that means in terms of the most effective. Any any thoughts, Fiona? It's less than a week. With any, it's less than a week that we've had vaccine available in this country. So we don't have evidence for here that there is the Dutch um, have been undertaking a study. They they looked at um, farms which were vaccinated. Um, I haven't seen any published data comparing that there's, there are subtle differences between the vaccines, but the the length that the speed that they got out and the time of the, the outbreak that they were available may um, Fudge data. So I, I'm not I'm not um, dodging the question. I just don't think we yet have clear information that would um, split between the vaccines. I, I I don't think that's available as yet. So again, we're in that learning phase, and more it'll become more clear as we as we move along. Um, the, the we next have one... made a very clear table for vets that that summarises the vaccines and the difference on their on their SPC on their guidelines and on their uh, our, um, contacts for each of the companies so uh, a com they're, they're they're not authorized vaccines they're under permit they have to be done through a vet there are all the requirements and um, that's very clear on this uh, we can summarize that but companies can speak directly to a vet and and give them different information that then can they can give widely for unauthorized products so um it's it's hard for the vets because it's it's information that's coming in very quickly but we've we've done what we can immediately and that vets can access that via the room and health welfare information for vets it's it's harder to get to than the main hub but it's possible and there's information there that all the veterinary associations have have contributed to but the manufacturers are the best place to go for their particular vaccine Okay, thank you for that, Fiona. A, a question here is, is it worth vaccinating given that it takes three to four weeks for the vaccine to take effect and we're coming up to winter? <clears throat> what are our thoughts on that for those out in the field? Million Fiona? dollar question. We that, Well, we can say in the Netherlands last year, their first outbreak was in the first week of September. They were still seeing cases through to the end of November and and had on some on some farms very high mortality so by the time they got to october november the dutch farmers were desperate for vaccines um we don't know the different year different weather conditions we don't know what's going to happen now um we we yeah that's why we're trying to do the survey to get an idea of how bad things are um probably realistically early spring vaccination campaign would be really helpful and people being prepared for next year so my feeling is we're unlikely to in the vector free period over the winter we're unlikely to be lucky enough to eliminate blue tongue from the country which means we're at massive risk when the temperature gets to above that magic 40 degrees that Sasha talks about and personally i would prefer to have a, a vaccinated flock by or herd by then um some of the in the netherlands they they vaccinated sheep initially because people had seen high issues and mortality in sheep some of the, some of the experts say there's more logic in vaccinating cattle because they're a, a greater um amplifier of the disease so from a a, a country basis it's possible we should be more widely vaccinating cattle as i say 
we're doing yep. what we can with the information we have. <laughs> Yep, no, no, that, that's that, that's that, uh, very helpful. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry, Andy. Did you? Yeah, no, I was, I was just going to add to that. I mean, and I think Sasha rightly talked about the, you know, the the midge vectors and and the temperatures at which they uh, can develop the virus, so that when they become infected, uh, you know, above 12, 14 degrees, they can start to replicate the virus and become infectious themselves those midges that are already infectious can if they were to bite an animal and they can bite below that temperature they can still infect animals so uh, whilst the rate of spread is going to reduce it doesn't mean there won't be any spread um, just because the temperature stopped below 12 or 14 degrees if there's infectious midges around still um, they and they bite they could still infect new animals so so there is still some benefit from yeah vaccination and protection just, just despite the fact the rate of spread is probably reducing as you get into the colder climate yeah so <clears throat> i think the basic line is there vaccinate where as soon as possible wherever possible i think is the basic line um this is a very specific Jason, question it might be just worth saying the vaccine is not completely protective it will suppress it doesn't guarantee you will not get blue tongue what they found in the netherlands is less severe mortality so but it I, I wouldn't like people to go away and think if i vaccinate i, I will definitely not get it which yeah, was yeah. the case pretty much more with some of the other blue tongue um that these btv3 vaccines have been shown to suppress clinical signs and suppress but but not eliminate yeah re really good point of clarification thank you fiona this is a specific question now uh, two day rare breed show, the 4th and 5th of October. The mart is only about seven to eight kilometres from the western boundary of East Yorkshire. Uh, that would be East Yorkshire part of the restricted zone. Do you know if BTV3 cases in East Yorkshire are drifting towards this western boundary? The worry is that if they take the sheep on the Friday and uh, enter it, and, and I have entered the RTZ and it's extended overnight, uh, is that a risk? Um, to include the location of the marts so my sheep are then not sold and cannot be taken home on the Saturday. So that's really about pro, uh, progression uh, uh, predictions. Andy? I mean, I wish I knew and could predict like that. That'd be great. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I just don't think we can we can say clearly there's still disease spread. Um, so so yep. you know if, if disease was detected there then then the zone either would be extended or potentially a zone put in place and there would be restrictions on moving animals out um i'm sure we would want to work hard to to get animals that have come temporarily into that area um out but but i really couldn't give any assurance on that until we kind of saw what the circumstance was so it's it, it's a very difficult risk and i don't think i could predict what would happen it, it, and it is, a move, it is a moving target, of course. Exactly. Yeah. There's always a lag between identification of clinical cases and notification and confirmation to there's a lag between people moving and, you know, mo moving animals is a, is a risk um, at the moment. We know those cases in Wales were moved completely um, legally from a place yeah. which was not in the zone at the time of movement so people should bear that in mind that they're not risk-free just because they haven't currently they're not currently in a zone i'm going to ask one more final question i know we have a lot more to go and we will provide the answers to those subsequently this is a, a another specific question about movement if movement is allowed within our Z, is it not a concern that sheep bought at a market within a higher risk area, e.g. Norfolk, could be brought in further west into the RZ, e.g. into the lower risk western side of Hampshire, and therefore increase the risk of the zone spreading further? Um, so a, a quick uh, answer to that, if we could, please. I think that's probably Andy. Uh, the, the honest answer is, I think, moving animals carries a risk and, and, and clearly moving them around the zone um, increases the risk of, of moving disease. But, but obviously the whole point of the zone and why there aren't restrictions is to allow some, some degree of, you know, 
business continuity in those areas. So, um, I, I think that's yes, really it's not important. ideal, but but obviously, that, so don't move them if you don't need to. But clearly, business also needs to continue. I, I think that's a really important message. Defra is trying to be as pragmatic as possible within the constraints of of, of notifiable disease management, as well as allowing the the industry to still function. So it it, it is a matter of risk assessment, isn't it, in terms of um, how the, the restrictions are contained. And, and that's a really good point. Don't move if you don't need to. And, and containment is, is, is really the answer um, in terms of any ter uh, prevention of further spread. I'm going to um, now refer to everyone the additional support that's available and the Blue Tongue Resource Hub. There's a huge amount of information, both in terms of the information the technical information uh, to answer some of these questions but also really importantly and Fiona touched on this the um, devastating impact on mental health of the farming community that are affected by uh, such disease outbreaks so uh, we've got a number of different support services available to assist farmers in terms of just dealing with the, the extreme uh, stress associated with um, with with these uh, outbreaks, which we've experienced uh, time and time again, unfortunately, the there is um, specific detailed information on the uh, on the on the Gov site in terms of uh, the details that uh, Sasha went through earlier. Uh, the AHDB site has got a huge resource pool available in terms of mapping and uh, details. I've just received a note there that also we have an up-to-date list of the designated abattoirs. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, see some of those abattoirs that we've been waiting on to be designated, finally designated, so that we can uh, get those uh, sheep slaughtered uh, locally as, as we've been uh, looking forward to them. And I would also emphasize, please do um, scan the QR code uh, that, that Fiona put up there so that we can um, capture the information and uh, use that information to try and assist the farming community. I think I've covered everything. There are a lot of questions that are yet to be answered, but what we will do is we will um, answer those questions and the recording of this um, webinar will be circulated within the next 24 hours. In the last, um, and the questions will be uploaded uh, to the um, to the um, RHW uh, Room and Health and Welfare site as well. So you'll get all of those answers uh, distributed across. So we should be able to get that information for you. If anyone does have any answer, uh, questions that you haven't asked, during the, this this uh, webinar, please do get in touch through H AHDB. Um, AIMS members, please do reach out to us and we will provide um, if the information was specifically with regards to abattoirs, but also if there's any producers out there that we can assist, then we will certainly put you in contact with those experts that, uh, that can assist similarly. In the last minute and a half, are there any final points from any of the panelists? No. So um, I will simply conclude by saying thank you to AHDB. It's a hugely important uh, resource for uh, everyone within the farming community. Thank you so much for our panelists for taking the time to come and give us uh, your, your thoughts and your expertise in this area. And if I, for all of you participating in this webinar, please go on the AHDB website to see the date uh, and time of the next webinar so that we can uh, continue this, this this conversation and as more information comes forward it, we will be able to answer more and more questions. On that note I'm going to say good evening to you all and thank you. <clears throat>